Um, I will check. I'm getting recorded. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing just a moment. Do you see it's recording? I want to make sure. I'm going to pause share. I'm going to stop sharing a moment. Oh, wow. And yes, we are recording. So everyone's bigger now <laughs> for just a moment. So we're going to go ahead and get started and start with the introduction, just so that everyone knows who's on here. And that way, as people come on too, they can join into the introductions. We may have people coming in a little bit later based on classrooms and um, things like that and technology. <laughs> So first of all, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Kelly Sinkowski and Jan and I, Jan will introduce herself, but Jan and I are the um, co-coordinators for the Ottawa ISD. I also work full-time at Ferris State in e-learning and for um, whatever committees they have, like I'm on the MTSS committee for the Mission of Education and whatever else they might need me on for gifted needs and uh, past president of the Michigan Association for Gifted Children. So, and done consulting on my own side business quite a bit with families and training for teachers and PD for 20 years. Oh, cool. So lots of hats and I'm a parent of gifted children as well. So um, just wanted to get started on that. And as far as what we should talk about, I think a little bit about yourself, what brings you here today and um, what, what brings me here today, way back 20 some years ago were my kids, I have five kids. So that was, I've got twice exceptional students, high anxieties, clinical, all that fun stuff. So yeah, dyspraxia, all kinds of things. <laughs> so I'm just saying that so I can relate to all of you, wherever you're at or whoever you're teaching. <laughs> um, so who would like to go next? Because everyone's squares are different order on my screen than yours. <laughs> Well, I'm Al Weinberger. You guys invited me to talk, and I'm a clinical psychologist in Grand Haven. Perfect. Um, uh, before that, I was a professor at Grand Valley, which is what brought me to this part of the country. And before that, I was an active duty psychologist in the Air Force. Before that, I did my graduate work at University of Oregon and undergraduate at um, University of Washington. And um, I've been in private practice now for quite a while. And um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Jan? Oh, okay. And I'm helping Kelly out as um, a GT consultant for the OAISD, the Iowa Area Intermediate School District. And we, uh, we did that last year. We enjoyed it. And um, now we're continuing this year. Also, um, I'm on the MAGC, the Michigan Association for Gifted Children Board and also the, um, the head of the education committee for that. I was at Whitehall District Schools for um, um, more than 20 years and also um, in charge of the gifted program there. So I'm really glad to be here today. Let's see, Tina? I'm on my school Chromebook, so I just want to say as this goes on, my face will go away so I can unmute and mute myself. I'm Tina Gallo. I am a counselor at North Muskegon Public Schools, and this year my school um, actually started funding Gifted and Talented and um, funding a leader, which that is me. So um, I'm here both as a fan of Dr. Weinbarger's, but also um, in that GT role. So thanks for having me. Cool. Uh, Stacy. My name is Stacy Dieter, and I'm the director of support services at Zealand Christian School. And um, what brings me here is um, we often have um, been known for our supports for students who maybe are um, falling below grade level, but um, have not had as much experience with um, the other side of that spectrum. So we have two students in particular that I'm kind of thinking through today that um, meet that twice exceptional um, uh, area and label. And so I'm just trying to think what, um, what other information there is to learn about. And Joanna? Hi, I'm Joanna Hodges, and I'm a grandparent of a child that we suspect is gifted but hasn't been tested yet. And I'm just trying to find everything I can about 
what options there are and what resources in the area. I sat in on the call in September and, and gleaned a lot of information from that. I really appreciate um, everything I took away from it. So looking forward to this one as well. Wonderful. So I'm gonna share screen to just show the agenda real quick here. Um, so we just have updates and um, districts as well as MAGC uh, updates. Just to start out, does anybody have any as far as what their district is doing this year or a class? It's so nice for us to be able to hear what is going on out there out of our little boxes <laughs> and um, just what is working or what you've tried this year sounds like a couple of you are trying different things this year does anyone want to share anything going on in their classes or districts <clears throat> nothing <laughs> that's fine go ahead tina yes I'll share. Um, so last year, um, I attended with our superintendent um, the uh, visit, the site visit of the Zealand Public Schools and the gifted program they had there with the fourth and the fifth grade. Um, and that really kind of inspired us to come back and kind of rework some of our upper L. And so we have um, this year a dedicated fourth grade teacher that is um, trying to model that and that seemingly even with hybrid and virtual and all the other things that COVID has thrown at us Wonderful. seemingly is helping differentiation and um, advancement. So that's something small, but something that definitely got rooted from that visit to Zealand. So that's where we're that is huge. I don't feel like that's small. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. That's a huge update. And will impact so many students and families. So that's, that's wonderful. And I and love to hear that that came from the Zealand field trip. <laughs> wonderful. In, in North Muskegon, uh, can families school of choice in for this program or is it just for people that are already in the, the, the I'm sorry, the, in the North Muskegon program? Yeah, I do feel that that is the future um, right now because of our return to school um, way of, we have school of choice, but it wasn't as if that was a choice to choice in. Mm -hmm. um, I do see that coming, but um, with COVID and all of our return to learn plans and all of that, that, that was been a bit overstretched for this oh, pilot. Yeah, I should have said in normal times when the pandemic yeah. is gone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. yeah, it's all good. We're all just, you know, working through the screens this year. <laughs> yeah, good. That's great that you guys are doing that up there. That's great news. Anyone else have anything going on in their classes or districts or conversations happening? Um, okay, so as far as um, MAGC, I'm gonna turn this over to Jan. All right, we have some MAGC updates. And the first is that our website, our MAGC website, which is migiftedchild.org. So that's the letter M and then the letter I. That is our website. So we have a new format for that and our e-images um, new newsletter is available on that website and also upcoming speakers and events. So like Dr. Al was um, listed on that website too for his um, speech today. Another thing is uh, one of our MAGC board members, Dante Dixon and his colleagues wrote an article in the Phi Delta Kappen publication and that was um, this fall. And the article focuses on how GT programs should move to an inclusive model that serve, serves more students. So the quote is, we propose that schools assess student progress regularly in all academic subjects in order to identify any student who isn't being sufficiently challenged. And I just want to put a little um, note on that. In my experience um, at Whitehall, uh, we've had, I would say, about 5 to 8% GT students across the board. And in other words, they were gifted in um, most subjects, 5 to 8%. And then 20 to 30% plus 
I would say we're um, advanced or gifted in one subject or more. So that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. And then another thing is that on the website, the applications for summer camp scholarships are available now and um, those are due by March 1st. So if you have anyone interested in going to a summer camp that's advanced or um, academically oriented, then um, you can look online and get the application and turn it in by March 1st. All right, so that's the basic MAGC news. Thank you. So as far as anything at the Michigan Department of Education, we finished the new MTSS profile and components and all that good stuff that is um, being fanned out now to everywhere and gifted is now included in that is a piece of it as part of the conversation which it was not it's taken about two years to cycle through to finally get it um, the new one out there because they do a lot of piloting and a lot of meetings and really diving in on every component so that a new MTSS is inclusive of gifted students now so that's a big update but we haven't had any meetings in a couple months because they were just working through their training for that and stuff like that. So my next conversation will be to reconnect with, it's been about a year, uh, to reconnect with those doing the trainings. Now they're ready to roll that out and see if they have any, any kind of training for the gifted students because um, my guess would be they haven't put that in yet. And every focus group that we did around the state um, with the Michigan Department of Education, they requested information on gifted students because there's nothing in the state. So that's going to be my next um, thing that I pursue, but at least it's now in the MTSS requirements for the gifted students. So that's a, a backing schools and districts have now that we didn't have before to advocate. Um, so I did want to, before we transition into the guest speaker, because we are running pretty, pretty far ahead of schedule, but I would love to find out from each of you and I kind of got a little bit when you did introductions um, that you're in, one person's interested in the testing. I think that was Joanna and what options there were. But is there anything else that you guys came to the meeting hoping to learn or things you're wondering or something that would help you in your current roles or advocating for any students that you have or children you have that are gifted that we could make sure we cover? Yes, Tina. You know. So I'm always interested in the twice exceptional population and that's where I thought there was a marriage between talking to Dr. Al and um, this group. Um, not that I'm trying to lead his, his um, talk at all, but most definitely I think that for my 20 years of counseling experience and my almost 27 years in education, that seems to be a very gray area for the average educator to really be able to tease out and understand that population. So um, as a counselor, I always try to help tease that out, but really I, I lean on people like Dr. Al to really just kind of um, go more deeply than what I just as a school counselor can do to, you know, see. So I try to take really copious notes and observational things to assist, but, you know, it's not in my wheelhouse to to go farther than that, but um, I see on the mygifted.org, mygiftedchild.org, you know, there are, there is a section for twice exceptional, and of course, I've, I've heard for years about that term and tried to read as much as I can, but any resources specifically about that, I'm always interested in. Excellent. Anybody else, what you came to the meeting hoping to hear about or learn or what might be helpful to make sure we cover? All right, um, so with that, we are going to transition into our guest speaker. I am putting some links in the chat box for some of the documents that we're gonna do. So as we're going along, if you want to copy those at any point, you can feel free to do that. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Jan to introduce our guest speaker for the day. All right, thank you. 
We're honored to have Dr. Al Weinbarger speak to us today. He's a clinical psychologist from Grand Haven, Michigan, with many years of experience. And he said he's been doing it in Grand Haven, uh, I think since 1999, so over 20 years. And he's been an associate professor at Grand Valley State University and also has published several books. And one is Choosing a Therapist. Mm -hmm. Another one is Parenting Kids with ADD and ADHD, Real Tools for Real Life. And um, there are a couple other books too, a couple eBooks also. And then at the end of his um, speech or in, in the middle too, we'll have question and answer time for Dr. Al. So welcome Dr. Al Weinbarger. Thank you. And now just to make sure, I'm, we only blocked out until two. That's how long you're expecting to have me, right? As long as you have, we are fine with that. Oh, yeah, I, I, because I, I'm keeping clinic hours today, so sure. I'll have to quit it too. But, okay, well, thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, when I put together the handouts, I, I kind of did what I typically do is I did too much so that I could go in different directions if I wanted to. Um, and because some of the, the communication I'd had was that some parents wanted some, some information on talking to kids, you know, getting, keeping them connected during COVID. So I have some of that, but the one that I want to start with is the one that that's just put up there first. Um, now I know I'm preaching to the choir to a certain extent by putting up giftedness defined. It's just, I wanted to throw that up there just in case anybody had never read a definition of it and to kind of organize how I talk about testing. Because understanding a person and understanding um, testing is difficult and complicated um, with everyone. And what tends to happen is we oversimplify with test scores and then we kind of miss the forest for the trees. So, so what I mean is if you take an IQ score of 100 and you're using a regular IQ test like the Wexler, there's 176,000 combinations of subtest scores you can get to get the IQ of 100. So the only thing you can really know about any two people with an IQ of 100 is they're probably different from one another, um, not the same. And so what tends to happen with IQ scores and cognitive testing is everything gets too homogenized. So that's why traditionally, I mean, back in the day for giftedness and to be honest with you for cognitive impairment, people just over relied on IQ scores because they're tidy, you can get them you know, what's magical about an IQ of 130? There's nothing magical about it. it it's a tidy, two standard deviations above the mean. Um, it's a tidy cutoff. And so that makes it easy to talk about, but oftentimes difficult to understand. And that's why I put on the hand out there, the modern definitions really try to take in, uh, in a, into account general intellectual ability, abilities, specific abilities, leadership abilities, both the ability to lead in a tight area, but the limits of that ability as well. Uh, visual and performing arts, psychomotor ability, any area that, that you know you can assess a person and you wanna think about that when you're thinking about gifted, just like at the other end when you're thinking about um, you know, uh, cognitive uh, impairment, when you're looking at functional adaptiveness and their ability to you know, be on their own. And so all of that is in the mix. And so it always makes things very complicated. And it's, it's like trying to describe a painting that's got a million colors in it and trying to come up with, well, what does that, what does that look like? So in general, um, oh, thanks for going down. We skipped the definition there in general, the common characteristics. I'm working off a of paper guys. So, um, you know, you know, each one of these areas can be like a, a gift and also a strain on the person as you go through when you're thinking about the person interacting with everybody else. So when you look at language skills, you know, early on, kids that are, are, are going to have higher verbal IQs tend to form sentences more clearly, more quickly. They evolve past the single word communication to that telegraphic communication like want cookies um, they'll blow through that to I want cookies, you know, much quicker than the other uh, average child will do. And then adults kind of tend to gravitate to that because it's fun. I mean, it's fun to talk to little kids that, you know, have such advanced language skills, but then that can also kind of begin to wall them off from same age peers. Uh, learning abilities, you know, I mean, again, I'm preaching to the choir, mental sponges, absorbing uh, and incorporating new ideas, making connections that you know, seem obvious uh, once the connections are made, but oftentimes it takes a person 
with such advanced gifts to be able to do that. If you take something as simple as um, running shoes, you know how everybody runs in lightweight running shoes, right? Well, before the 1970s, Bill Bowerman, the track coach at my old alma mater, University of Oregon, was literally the first person to think about lightning running shoes. The guy was brilliant. And his, his runners, he would build shoes for his runners. And Oregon is to running what Michigan is to football. It's the most successful program in, in history. And his runners would laugh at him and say, well, what difference does it make if my shoe weighs one ounce less? And then he would say, well, if you take 3,200 steps in a 5,000 meter race, that's 200 pounds. You don't pick up and sat down over the course of that race. To us, looking backwards, it seems obvious. Oh, nobody runs in heavy shoes. Everybody runs in light shoes. But it took somebody like that to take that out, what now appears to be obvious, and recombine it. And oftentimes, folks that are gifted, or the kids that are in that category, labeled that, can do that much more quickly. And it's both a blessing and a burden, you know, at times for them to do. Um, you know, asking questions, you know, that show insight. Have you ever had a class get completely stopped by the really bright kid that keeps asking questions? Um, I got thrown out of honors English because I kept butting heads in high school with my high school teacher over the last of the Mohicans. And it was obvious she hadn't actually read it. Um, and she was, con and to the point I got tossed out of class. I stopped the class for a week. Um, and so, and I wouldn't move off of it. Um, and so, you know, it's again, a blessing and it can be a burden. It can be, uh, can be a challenge. So subsequently, like it says below that, folks that are, are labeled get talented or gifted, these kids tend to gra gravitate towards adults because you're more interesting. Um, you're talking about things that are a little more challenging. And adults, you know, kind of give you a get out of jail free card with all the social stuff, you know, that your same age peers are not going to give you a get out of jail free card for. Um, and so then it's, you know, it's, it's this natural thing that helps them grow and helps the neural connections form. It's a good thing. And I don't know about you, but I really like talking to bright kids. Um, but it's also, you've got to keep that eye towards being able to make sure it doesn't hinder them more than it helps them or hinder them in ways that, that it shouldn't. And then, you know, have you ever encountered the, the, the talented and gifted student who um, is rigid in their thinking? It's got to be the way that they think about it and it's their way to do it and they can understand it and become impatient because you can't understand it or that maybe you're not making the leaps that they're leaping and going at the pace that they're going. Um, and so that understanding of how they think is oftentimes really there. They're often cognizant of it, but they get rigid and can't move out of it and move out of it perspective take or translate. That's oftentimes the language I use when I'm working with a, a child. If I'm not making the leaps they're making is they have to translate for me what they're talking about. That's not about them. That's about them teaching me how to understand. Um, and so that we can, you know, we can kind of move forward, but that's in a one on one situation. And again, the world doesn't oftentimes give that to them. Um, and then, uh, oh, yeah, you know, Watson and Crick. Sorry, I meant to talk about them. You know, the two guys that are credited with finding DNA, right? Um, Watson was is an American um, who's still alive. He's like 95 or something. And Crick was a British researcher. And they're credited with discovering the double helix structure of DNA. When Watson got to England to work with Crick in his lab, everybody hated him because he was impatient with anybody that wasn't as bright as he was. The problem was there wasn't anybody there that was as bright as he was. So he was, in, and this was a, a group of really smart people. He was impatient and uh, Crick d described him as he was afraid he was too bright to be useful um, when he first got there. And Crick helped him by socializing him. Now Crick had like a family and kids and like a regular life in addition to his research life. And he would make Watson talk to his children um, and communicate with his children in ways that his children could understand his ideas uh, as a way to get him to go back at Oxford and Cambridge and be able to interface with those folks. And so, you know, and you know, Watson is still probably emotionally about 13. You know, he, he has all these racist and sexist ideas. He just got stripped of like all of his honors from the Cold uh, Harbor Institute and the Human Genome Project and all of that. Yeah. And so, again, he can't perspective take, he can't give loose of his way of thinking about it 
and it causes them, you know, lots and lots of trouble. Um, and then children, of course, that are in, in the category talented and gifted oftentimes have superior but selective concentration. And so many times I'll get kids that are quite bright sent to me because people think they have ADHD. Um, when in fact, oftentimes what it is for those guys is the, the pace, especially for elementary school students, is just too slow. And so what happens is if the average kid needs something explained three times, teachers are gonna explain it three times, as they should. I'm no education professional, but I think they should do that. But the problem for the kids at the upper end of the IQ spectrum is they're gonna get it the first time and then have to listen to it be re-explained two more times before you moved on to the next thing. What I say to parents, it, it would be as if I repeated the same sentence three times before I said the next thing. And the, the average parent could hang with me talking that way for about three or four minutes. And then after that, they'd still be looking at me and nodding and being polite, but their brain would be gone because it would just be impossible to focus. And these guys are doing that all day long. And it, it gets better, at least in my um, experience, in middle schools and high schools where they can track into different classes and they can do accelerated classes and you know the pace isn't quite as slow for them um, as it can often be. And so, and then oftentimes, you know, being having a high IQ can be co-occurring with ADHD as well. It's not like they're mutually exclusive from one another, but they mimic each other a, a lot. Um, and so that's why, uh, well, right now I'm not doing it because you can't really do IQ testing with PPE. I mean, you shouldn't. If you have to, you, you can do it, but you shouldn't do it because, you know, some of the timed components on the IQ test, it'll artificially suppress their IQ scores if you're wearing masks and they're wearing masks. And so right now, I'm not, I haven't done any IQ testing in a while, but normally, if there's any concern, I do a brief IQ and achievement battery just to make sure I'm working in the ballpark I think I'm working in um, with the child and not, not somewhere else. And then, oh, okay, so and the emotional and behavioral traits, um, you have them up there, I think. And um, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's important to like think about this when you're thinking about any particular child, because the one thing you can be certain of for any child that falls into the talented or gifted category is they're probably different from a lot of the other kids that fall into that category. And understanding a kid is like, I don't know, like understanding a sculpture or something. You've got to see it from all the way around. You can't just look in one direction and, and go, okay, the IQ is really high and not pay attention to the rest of it. Like the, the first one, emotional intensity or reactivity, you know, that's listed as this generic thing, but imagine if that's what you're doing when you're trying to interface with your world and you know communicate and learn and, and do all of that, that's an extra burden that the person that's not intense or reactive doesn't have to carry. Um, and so their day is actually less difficult than the person who is, is intense or reactive. Um, sensitivity to other people's feelings can be overly sensitive can also struggle a lot with perspective taking, again, emotionally perspective taking. If it doesn't bother me, I don't understand why it bothers you. And this is a common thing among humans anyway. Like, you know, the one thing I tell parents when they're working with anxiety is you wanna stop telling people how they should feel or they're, they're okay. It, it doesn't matter how they should feel, it matters how they do feel. And then you start there and you manage going, going forward. Um, yeah, social maturity, because again, that's, you know, can come from all of those just thousands and thousands of behavioral learning episodes that they, that really bright ch children can miss because they're adults or they're just narrowing their social circle because nobody likes being bored and nobody likes being misunderstood. And, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of a pain to have to do that all the time. And it's easier if you just, you know, kind of move forward. And it, it can be unhealthy, but it's kind of how they adapt. My... I have an adult son who's a computer guy and he sent me this Batman meme that I wish I could have found when I was doing this talk, but it's Batman kind of laughing at the rest of us for now being socially isolated, you know, because <laughs> Batman's always socially isolated, you know, that's how he gets along and now the rest of us are kind of having to live that way. Um, but those, those issues can be in there. And then, um, you know, the keen powers of observation, again, a blessing, and sometimes a burden, you know, it's all uh, children as they move into adult years have to work on not saying everything they think. Um, and so then, you know, when you can think all of these clever ways to, you know, kind of come at somebody, 
and you speak them, it makes your life stress that much more difficult, you know, and it, the brighter the kid, the more way they, more ways they can think of to butt heads with you um, and to get you chasing your own tail when you're trying to like a dog that's confused when you're trying to kind of move forward. Um, and then um, poor organizational skills, messiness, and, you know, and back to the insistence on doing things their own way. The rigidity is oftentimes something that's just quite difficult, you know, to, to overcome. So moving on to the types of assessment there. Um, basically, when you understand a child, you always need parent input if you can get it, and you always need teacher input if you can get it, because they tend to spend a lot of time with those, those children. And so parents are always going to be experts on their own kids, because they see the child in multiple um, environments and reacting to multiple situations that the rest of us don't get to see. Um, teachers are always going to be developmental experts because they're kind of used to seeing iterative groups of fifth graders or second graders or 12th graders and kind of have a pretty good idea, not just cognitively, but emotionally, behaviorally, socially, you know, what's typical and what comes at high cost and what doesn't come at high cost. And so you always want to include that anytime you're trying to, to do a, a, an assessment and, and the, for anybody, but especially at this end of the, of the IQ spectrum. Because again, it's so tempting and it's so easy to just fall back on the objective scores and only operate there. But then when you do, you miss so much of what the kid's capable of and what the kid's dealing with that you're oftentimes lost at sea. Rowing a boat with one oar, I don't know, pick your metaphor, but it gets hard to go forward because you don't have all the information that you need you know, to go forward. And the, um, the, the times that missing things and over relying on, on test scores or failing to get test scores, the times those, the difficulties those cause are, are, are just tremendous. And it's trying to avoid that in any kind of good assessment. So like it says up top, you really do need to have um, parents, teachers, if you can get it. And then IQ testing. So I'm just curious for the professionals talking to me, you've heard of Alfred Binet of the Stanford Binet IQ test probably. Do you know why Binet made the first IQ test? What the purpose of it was? To identify talented and gifted kids. Everybody was focusing on impairment and he was focusing at the other end of the spectrum and was curious about why really bright kids of the same ages tended to be good at the same things and make the same mistakes. It was literally identified. And then the French government, um, he's from France, the French government um, took a hold of it. And excuse me, guys, I'm getting paged for a second here. Forgive me for a second. I have to step out for one second. I'll be right back. Thanks. We have an outside way of getting into the building and somebody just paid to be trying to get into the building. But anyway, so the French government paid Alfred Binet um, to develop this because the French government in the early 1900s was trying to identify talented and gifted students so they could engineer programs for them so that they could, you know, move forward. So everybody, or most people tend to think of IQ testing as identifying, you know, people at the cognitive impairment end, but actually the first standardized scientifically vetted IQ test was not designed for that. It was designed uh, for the other end of the spectrum. But Benet, if you ever want to read about somebody interesting, he's an interesting guy. He, um, he was being published as a, in ethnology journals when he was a teenager. He would write articles about the acquisition of knowledge and submit them. And they thought he was a freelance professor. He was offered a job at a university at like 14 because they didn't know he was a kid. Um, and so, yeah, so he was a pretty interesting guy. And then the most common IQ test in the United States is Wexler system. It's a system that I use. It's a system um, that just about everybody uses um, mainstream ones. Um, part of the reason I use it, well, there's two main reasons. The norming samples are better. The, the test construction is better. Stanford University took over the Binet in the mid 1900s and it became the Stanford Binet. Um, and it's a really good test, but the norms are a little bit squirrely. Secondly, is it's extremely difficult to administer and it takes a really long time um, to do. The Wexler is not a picnic to administer um, and it takes a, a really long time as well. But the Binet, I don't think has any 
gigantic incremental validity. It doesn't do a better job than the Wexler system does. Um, but that's just, you know, everybody that does my job has their own opinion about that. But they study the psychometrics. So what are psychometrics? So what does an IQ score of 100 tell you? Tells you you're at the 50th percentile. And that's what it tells you. So remember, and for the parents, a percentile score just tells you what percentage of the population you're higher than or what percentage of the population you're lower than. So the IQ tests are set up to have an average IQ be 100 and the standard deviation to be 15. Standard deviation just is a way to describe how many people the score captures. So you guys have probably seen the bell curve and heard about a bell curve. It's a normal distribution. And so in IQ scores, um, the difference between 100 and 101 is very different than the distance between 130 and 131 uh, in the number of people that are, it's gonna capture. And so it's not linear. It's not like a ruler where the distance between one inch and two inches is the same as the distance between 11 inches and 12. Um, the distance, the, the meaning out here is different from the meaning in there. And so whenever you're getting an IQ test or any standardized test explained to you, the person needs to be able to translate it into useful information. So if we had a kid with an IQ of 130, um, you would just wanna say, well, you know, when we compare little Johnny or little Janie to a nationwide sample of other people their age, um, they did better on this than about 97, 98% of kids their age. So they've got a lot of horsepower under the hood more than most people. Um, and if you kind of understand that, then what you can do is then go on to say, but that doesn't mean that they're not different from other people. That doesn't mean they're not unique. That doesn't mean they don't have their own pattern of individual strengths and weaknesses. That's where splitting IQ up in the verbal and performance IQ um, comes into it. So the average, I, or the Wexler will give you a, a full scale IQ and a verbal and a performance IQ and then other standard scores that you can derive from it. And it's just reflecting kind of one of the big ways to think about intelligence. Because, you know, we don't really know what intelligence is, right? I mean, it's a multifaceted thing, like who knows? Um, but what the IQ test does a really good job of, there's about 100 years of literature on it, now about 110. An IQ test is a really good predictor of what you should be capable of doing academically. Um, and so if your IQ is here, but your achievement is there or there, well, that's interesting and probably meaningful. Um, and so if you know you are an A student, straight A student and your IQ is 130, well, that's not really surprising and it's really consistent. But if your IQ is 130 and you're getting C's and D's in your classes, now that's interesting on a bunch of different levels. Could be there's some sort of learning disorder there, could be a motivational issue there, could be that rigid thinking, I only do things my way and I'm not gonna do them the way you want them to be done. All of these, uh, th those gaps could be explained by many different things, which is where the supplemental testing begins to come in. So you start with your IQ test, you figure out where, in a deviation kind of way, where does the kid fall? Is the kid typical, doing way better than typical, cognitive ability-wise, less than typical? Okay, then I move on to the achievement testing. I like the Wyatt, that's, I'm sorry, I got lazy there. That's the Wexler Individual Achievement Test. It's normed on the same norming sample that the Wexler IQ test is normed on. So I like using that because then I know that, that there's not some system how um, Woodcock Johnson, which is another good test, how they developed their norming sample versus how um, Wexler did. So that I make sure I'm comparing apples to apples and not apples to crab apples. Um, so that I'm, at least I can rest comfortable in that. So then you go in and you, we go, I go in and I do some achievement testing and look to see what is what. So now it's not necessarily gonna be that the achievement test matches the IQ. It's not gonna be that it's higher than the IQ. It's not necessarily gonna be lower. We just accept what's there and then begin to think about, well, how do I need to go about understanding that? So the, the standardized scores give me, a, 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 well, full scale IQ tells me like what ballpark I'm in, what stadium I'm sitting in. And then, you know, the uh, performance in verbal IQs, the fluid and crystallized 
kind of tell me what section I'm sitting in. And then the subscales will tell me what seat I'm in. And then that's the same thing with the achievement test. And so once I kind of figure that out, then I want to begin to go and look at like, well, why are we here? And that's where the supplemental testing that gets ignored that really should be done becomes very, very important. So I know I spun off into cycle babble there for a little while. So I'm back now. Uh, questions about, about what I said or things that didn't make sense and see if I can translate them. Okay, I'm going to assume I can yeah, go. I've got a question, Dr. L. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, about the Kaufman. Did I miss the Kaufman? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I didn't. I Because I was glancing at the clock, I wanted to move on, and I skipped the Kaufman. Oh, okay. But that's also a very good shorter, IQ test. That's a shorter test, right? I'm sorry? It's a shorter IQ test? It's shorter. It has more nonverbal uh, components to it um, and can often be useful for younger kids. The, the Wexler system is split into three different ones. It's got a preschool primary, it's got kids, and it's got adults. Um, Kaufman just has uh, the same set of subsets, but you can use them differently. And the Binet is just one gigantic test um, that goes across the spectrum. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I skipped it because I was trying to move on. Okay. Question okay. on the different tests. Is there one that has a higher ceiling as far as when you're doing the tests to see how high they can go so you know what kind of accommodations to do? Like do you, if you think a student is profoundly gifted, is there one you would choose over the other ones? Well, you know, probably if I thought I needed to do that, I'd probably use two because you, like with a Wexler or a Stanford Binet, giving them repeatedly, you run the risk of practice effects. So if I give the same test twice, I mean, you really ought to wait a year um, in between administering the same test to the same kid. But if I felt like I needed more information than I got from the Wexler, I'd probably use the Binet. Or if I thought that I wasn't getting what I, uh, what I needed from it, or I didn't trust it for some reason. Now, I'll be honest with you, the Binets are so expensive. I don't own the most current one because I rarely ever used it. I, I just didn't invest the money in the last one because it costs a lot. I mean, schools can invest, you guys can buy it, and I'll borrow yours, but, the, um, but I personally only own the Wexler system. But that's what I would do is, is use both. Same with unachievement. If I feel like the, the Wyatt isn't giving me what I want or there's squirrely results there that I don't understand, I can give the Woodcock-Johnson because I have both of those as well. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful because um, I know Linda Silverman, the, the Gifted Development Center, uses the Stanford Binet 2 because it has a higher ceiling if it's that particular subset student, you know, child. And the two is, is the two's pretty old. So, um, mm -hmm. and then when uh, you just got to make sure that the norms you're using, um, because like I'm older than probably most of you, but like when I went through high school, there weren't. PCs. Um, I took a typing class on a typewriter. Um, and so, so it's the, you know, there's this generational change that makes the more modern norms kind of more important. Yep. Um, and then some of it, you know, of course, I'm skipping over big things. We could spend hours talking about like cultural differences and things like that that are in, there's problems inherent in all of the testing. But all right. So if we, let's say we got our Wexler and we've gotten uh, our, our, we've gotten our IQ and we've gotten our achievement test, we still need to kind of understand the rest of the child. And so typically it's good, depending on the age of the child, to at the very least use some form of, some form of standardized depression and anxiety scale with them. Because I just, I just had this conversation with somebody right before this came on because I, I got a phone call and a, a, a special ed director was asking me if I thought there could be an organic reason for a kid who's never had reading comprehension problems to suddenly have reading comprehension problems. I'm like, well, of course it could be, like if they hit their head or they got a disease or something, but um, what's their personal life like? Well, their parents just went through a divorce. And I'm like, well, so probably anxiety and depression are vapor locking the kid's brain and you know probably not following along very well because they're distracted by what they're bothered by um so you know the kids in fifth grade never had a reading comprehension problem before has always been an a student i would look outside of that to go and 
I said, send, you know, have her go to the school psychologist or the school counselor and talk a little bit or have the parents, you know, make an appointment with somebody. But it oftentimes gets missed. And that's not a, that's not throwing stones at teachers. We all tend to see what we do is most important. Um, and so, because some, if somebody brings a question to me, I'm immediately going to go, okay, well, it could be organic causes, but maybe it's something else. But if you take it to a neuropsychologist, they're going to be, well, let's look at organic causes first and rule them all out. And then let's look at this. But again, there's always limits to what you're doing. And you just, whoever you're working with as a professional needs to be aware of it and needs to provide that third leg. Because really, it's like building a three-legged table. You know, you, you really need these supplemental um, instruments to, to guide you to where you're going. Also very true of ADHD, just like really bright kids look inattentive, sometimes really anxious kids look inattentive. Um, and it's not that they can't pay attention, it's what they're paying attention to, um, which is what's bothering them instead of, you know, what the teacher is teaching. Uh, and so when you get into teenagers using something that's a little more labor intensive, but yields a lot more information, something like the MMPIA, which is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It's lengthy, but what's really nice about all three of these is all three of these are empirically derived. What that means is not rationally derived. Rationally derived means a bunch of Dr. Al types sit around and say, a depressed child should respond like this, and an anxious child should respond like that. And what a, an empirically derived instrument does is they give it to thousands and thousands of kids group the kids together based on how they respond to the test and then study the groups and see what kind of common themes are in there. And so those are a lot more helpful to understanding things than uh, necessarily rationally derived instruments are. But it's long. The MMPI has 478 true and false questions on it, I think. Yeah, and, but what I tell teenagers is, but I need to see it twice a week for like the next six months to learn this stuff. Which path do you want to take? So the teenagers always go for the two hour test and not having to come in and see me twice a week for the next five years. But so that can so much, um, the combination of such testing will give you that third leg you need to understand like why this is the way it is, why this child functions the way he or she does, or, or why you know she's excelling or failing to excel, why she's exploding or failing to explode you know, looking for those answers on how, who the person is as a kid. Because you might notice every time I say the talented and gifted kid, I kind of stutter. It's because I was trained at a cognitive and behavioral place. And I don't talk about ADHD kids. I talk about kids with ADHD. And not because it's a word game, but because I think it's very important. That's not central to who they are. It's part of who they are. Um, and being gifted isn't necessarily central to who they are. It's a big part of who they are. But then there's the emotional, the developmental, the life history, all of those things that are going on, you know, with the child as well. And especially important if you feel like you're, you've programmed something for the kid that should be making sense given the IQ and I, achievement testing scores. You've got really good educators that are much, I'm no expert on curriculum development. You've got good curriculum development in place for that child, customized for that child, and the child still doesn't seem to be clicking. The, the answer is probably is probably in there. And these aren't hard to give. Um, they're actually fairly easy to give. But again, just like with the IQ testing scores and the achievement testing scores, you need to make sure the person using them understands how to explain them to you and then understands their limits and their, um, and their strengths. And then I also remember at the start of the doing an assessment, you want to make sure you're talking to parents. We also always give a standardized questionnaire to parents and to teachers. I mean, I'm not doing teachers right now because it's kind of hard to get them. I mean, maybe I can get them again now. Some of the schools are back in, but um, to the extent that we can to make sure that I'm, I'm getting that view from that typical developmental expert on what's going on with that kid emotionally and behaviorally, not just academically, because I'll capture the academic side with the IQ and the achievement testing, at least the basic skills. Um, but I need to know how that person's functioning as a person uh, to be able to kind of prepare an evaluation and then turn it over to you guys. And then Kelly, you were asking me at the beginning, what, do, what guidance for schools and for parents? If you have a, an evaluation done and you feel like your child should qualify for those services, because remember all the way back at the definition, the point of, at least as I understand it, is not just to label people as talented and gifted, but 
to develop supports and programs that that person needs to, you know, bloom to the extent possible. So now you have, you, at least on the psychological side, cognitive ability side, emotional and behavioral side, you have a, a pretty decent picture of the child. Um, where I send parents to go is to start with, is to start with the school principal and the school counselor, and then get the school psychologist involved. And I know there aren't very many school psychologists anymore. The very first school district I ever went to was in Seattle when I was an undergraduate. Every single building in the Seattle School District had a PhD school psychologist in it. Um, and now there's like, what, one per district maybe? Um, and so, but that would be the person that I would start with and to communicate the report to and then ask for just a child study meeting for the teacher and the special ed director who tends to understand testing and if there's a talented and gifted coordinator and the classroom teacher and the parents to sit down and look at, you know, what you've learned about the child and how does that mesh with what's going on here. Um, because I'm, I always fall short because I'm not a curriculum development person. I'm not an expert on those things. I just do this part of it and then try to work on the behavioral and the emotional side. So I've been talking really fast for a long time. So questions, concerns? Okay, I'm gonna assume maybe if you have questions, you can feel free to, I think Kelly has my contact information. Um, you have the little handout I gave you. And then these other two things, just look at them, you know, for talking about COVID and talking about how to stay connected. Um, the, uh, the, the most important thing on staying connected, I think, is to make sure that if you're having your child schedule things like meetups online with their friends and stuff like that, is schedule it. Schedule it and then treat it as a responsibility so that they get through having that social connection. About a thousand years ago, when I turned 19, I was on my first deployment in the Army. And we were in the field. I used to, my job was calling in artillery and airstrikes, and we were tactical. And out comes the chaplain to meet with us. And the platoon sergeant said, who wants to go to chapel? I had been made to go to church my whole life. I wasn't going to chapel. Two or three guys went. And then uh, the platoon sergeant put out security guys to keep us safe. And the rest of us did calisthenics with body armor on the entire time church was going on. So that then the next time the chaplain came out, uh, there was 100% attendance at chapel. Um, I was sitting in the first row because sleeping with my eyes open was far preferable to doing push-ups with body armor. On. And he didn't do that to us because he was being mean. It was because he knew we needed to be exposed to somebody that was out there that cared about us, that was providing us some support and a place to talk. We, weren't just, we just weren't mature enough to realize we needed to be mature enough. Um, and so on the social connected things, whatever they do, try to get it to schedule. You schedule things, get, get done. Uh, things that are all just do it on the fly never get done and you know, we all tend to kind of gravitate uh, our, our warts and blemishes come out worse when we're under stress like COVID isolation and all of that so so those ideas are in the in the other two handles so and um, I think Tina had a question I think Tina had a oh I'm sorry I'm getting a bad echo oh, sorry. I'm getting a bad... yeah it could be me <laughs> 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 Let's assume it's me. I'm probably going to have to take my video off too. I think I'm freezing a little bit. Um, so my question is just an anecdotal one. Can you hear me? I can. It's broken up, but I can hear you. So I, I'm noticing that our uh, talented and gifted at North Ski and then again, my district is unique in the sense that uh, DA12 is I'm totally losing you now. I, I, I I'm totally losing. You're picking up, Tina. Could you just put it in the chat box, and then we can try to get an answer for you. At least uh, on the recording too, we can have an answer for you. I could understand her at first, but I, I can't hear it anymore. Yeah. 
Okay, she in the chat put question about anxiety increasing with GT under COVID. Um, oh, right, yeah, because the, um, basically the social connections, there aren't as many of them anyway. And so then they're, they're pairing back more yeah. and that natural tendency, now I'm, I'm hearing myself, but this natural tendency to gravitate inward. So that's why um, you want to impose a little structure on getting it done. And then also to include them and get them out to schedule some things like virtual field trips and stuff like that, so that you're involved, you don't embarrass them, but you facilitate it, it happens. Oh, hang on. Uh, hey, come in, come in, come in. Getting it done, and also. Guys, I'm sorry, I have to get off because my patient is actually here. Thank you so much. Well, I hope it was helpful to you guys. And, uh, and if you need anything else, just send an email to, you have that contact email from my office manager and I'll get to you whatever it is you need. Thank you so much, today it was wonderful. We'll uh, oh. go through your handouts, thank you. All right, great, thanks guys, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Um, so we do have the handouts too. But the question was about anxiety with COVID and with the handouts, uh, talk through that as far as how to handle that because we, we do have just inherent in the gifted student or adult or young adult is going to be increased anxiety because they see the world differently, they experience it differently and they're always trying to fit in and they have a different understanding. So they have increased anxiety already. Now, now you're adding a situation and scenario with the COVID and all this going on and potentially relatives getting sick. And that makes the non-typically, um, you know, anxious person. So people that don't even get very anxious, anxious. So you can imagine those that have like clinical anxiety, like the gifted, and then they're adding this on top of it. So that was a really good question. So I think just, I think talking, to them and again this is obviously like anything else is going to be age appropriate talking um, but if you have a even a high schooler it's still you know whenever there's stress like the doctor's talking about everybody but um, in this case the gifted they go back to their own coping mechanisms and for gifted it can be suppressed age coping mechanisms so they can it can trigger their, their anxiety can trigger <clears throat> Um, emotional suppression so they can act younger and they don't process like if they're a high schooler they when they're stressed they might end up processing like a fifth grader or whatever the case may be because that's where they can revert back to at the social level and their social emotional it can be suppressed but it comes out more when they're stressed so <clears throat> and that was a really good question so I think he has provided us a handout to hopefully um, give us a little guidance on this and how to talk with our with the whether it's students or children or grandchildren about um, the different scenarios and I think if you haven't already had COVID yourself or in the family or the student hasn't had it in their family it's potentially coming and so I think it is very important because again their anxiety is flare when this happens they find out somebody has it someone close to them or they could have been exposed I think it is um, important to talk through the blame thing you know nobody's blaming because someone got it doesn't mean they were negligent they could have had their mask they washed their hands it's it's just like the flu you don't blame the person because they got the flu you feel bad they got the flu so I think a lot of that is just walking through that with the youth <clears throat> or even young adults and in keeping it, um, I don't want to say real, but keeping it in perspective. So, you know, when they're, they're already socially inept, a lot of these students, they don't do really great. They'd rather stay home, be by themselves, be on the computer, be, have their, their virtual um, communities. So that actually will lead to 
more anxiety when it's time to go out and do something and be in a crowd or be in a group or go back to school because they've been online for two months. They're actually going to have higher anxiety than they normally would because now they're in their comfort zone staying at home. And now they're going back out with all these social things. It could be bullying, teasing, whatever. They don't feel like they fit in. So I think too that there needs to be some kind of um, <clears throat> awareness, first of all, on, on that, that that is going to be extremely anxiety provoking to them when they've been in a comfortable home place. And just have that awareness and help them talk through that. Because a lot of the times transitions are difficult for these students when they get comfortable somewhere and they have to transition, whether it's home all summer and go to school and they don't sleep for two weeks before school starts or whatever, they, or they get, you know, when they get older, it might just come out as attitude or behavior and they're actually anxious about school starting in a week or whatever the case may be. It's when you have the anxiety, the transitions can be difficult and can trigger that. So I think just kind of talking through, even with maybe they, they're home for a couple months and it's time to go back to school in the classroom or face to face. Maybe it's, uh, having that awareness, that conversation, hey, let's talk about this, let's think about it. You're gonna go back and be with your peers, you're gonna be on the bus again, what's that like? What things help you? Maybe they have sensory integration disorder because a lot of gifted students do have that and maybe buses are noisy, but home is quiet. You know, talk through that so that they're not caught off guard when it hits them and they go back into that and they kind of forgot how that is. So. Um, there's just a lot going on, I feel like, with the social emotional piece with gifted um, students, young adults, even adults, because a lot of gifted students have gifted adult parents. <laughs> so there's a lot of all that going on. And if you're in a household with them, it's your child or it's your grandchild, you see them often. Just be aware that giftedness runs in families. And so does the anxiety in general and, and what helps and what can help them. And, and it's just really helping them through these things, because these are different things we've never dealt with, adults, let alone the students and the kids, um, with all these changes and everything's closed, and you can't have birthday parties, and we always did, and and my sibling had this blowout party when they turned eight, but I can't now, and what's the deal? I mean, it's just all of those things that are different for everybody, so I think just having that awareness with them as everything comes up that if they get an attitude or they get grumpy about something or have what feels like an inappropriate social, social or emotional reaction just to something, that's probably what's going on. That's probably the anxiety piece and maybe they need to just take a moment and when they calm down to talk through that piece. Um, so this comes from being a parent as well as having that in the household and um, from my consulting as well. So if if you guys have great strategies for that as well, um, as we're talking through, please share. But I think that was a really good question to bring that up <clears throat> of how do you handle that? How do you talk through it? And I like that he's provided even a handout for that. Are there any other questions that came up from um, this piece? You know, COVID, anxieties, social emotional, are there or questions about what he talked about? Because Jan and I, can point to, to resources or answer from our research on things, that kind of thing, if you guys have questions since he couldn't stick around um, professionally to get an appointment to talk through. Yeah, Tina had some good ideas there about the book, Who, Who Moved My Cheese? That's an excellent book to discuss. And, um, and then your comment on mindfulness. I think that's another really good thing to focus on mindfulness is really good especially in this time excellent suggestion any other ideas or questions and if you have resources like that go ahead and add it to the chat if you want and you can do that by at the top of your screen getting out of you can exit full screen and then you'll be able to get to your chat and everything at, um, if you scroll on the bottom of your menu but um actually I can get out of this share screen so that it looked normal on your screen. <laughs> you can see people, there we go. So anything like that, if you have any suggestions or questions or, or thoughts when we were talking, even when I was just talking, did it bring anything up or a student up that we could help?
Well, I just, I have a little concern because one of my students, um, let's see, um, tested out in high school and of, um, let's see, out of trigonometry. And so he went right into calculus. Then he went to a two year um, school, community college, and uh, they said he, that he would have to take trigonometry in order to graduate, get his associates. So what do you think about that? So they made him repeat, huh? Yep. And he did really well in calculus. So I think that's something that needs to be discussed at the state level. Absolutely. And that is by district. <clears throat> we had the same situation at my school where they wouldn't put the accommodations in for a twice exceptional student. <clears throat> Pardon me. And my students went to, my kids went to a, you know, blue ribbon district that was considered gifted, um, sensitive and when they got to the high school, because gifted programming is in the education school, you know, the lower education, excuse me, elementary education, it's in the elementary school. So they had the programming, the pullouts. By the time they got to high school, they said, well, we don't, haven't had these combinations in place yet. So we're not going to do that for the SAT and ACT and all those things because they needed extra time. The problem was we had documented all along. It hadn't been a problem in school necessarily because they were able to cope. And if the, and one of the questions came up, I think Tina was about twice exceptional. A lot of times the twice exceptional issues don't show up until eighth or ninth grade. <laughs> and, but the school district just didn't have that training. I was talking to the counselor and I was trying to explain that, that it doesn't show up because they're so bright, these students, you know, gifted students, and especially the really high end gifted students, they create their own coping mechanisms to succeed and fit in and do what they need to do at school and all of a sudden they finally hit high school or even eighth grade and they're taking the high school classes a year ahead and those classes you can't just guess intuitively you can't know you know like when they're younger you can learn addition and subtraction and figure out multiplication division just they do that all the time right that you can figure out the next levels and next steps where when you get to, to high school and even college they can't guess, they have to learn it and they don't know how to learn. And all of a sudden when they have to learn it and they can't guess intuitively the next steps, their coping me mechanisms don't work. So it doesn't even show the twice exceptional pieces in many times. Now sometimes it does if it's ADHD or ADD and it, it, it's true ADHD that will show up, those kinds of things. Um, but even things like different types of dyslexia don't show up till later because they've created their own coping mechanisms. So if you know anything about twice exceptional, it a lot of times doesn't show until high school or eighth grade. And in the, and if the district doesn't understand that, then they'll say, hey, they've been fine in the higher classes all along, so we're not gonna do anything for them. And that's what we had happen. Um, so you can have the state um, level, whether they require it, or at some point, Jan and I have been working on it for 20 years, some point have legislation on it. It's still like, it has to be implemented at the district level. So whether you're a peer, an educator, administrator, if this type, these types of things are happening in your school or your district and you see it, please like educate them or, or point them to resources because it hasn't been a required thing in our state for um, teacher certification or, or even counseling. There hasn't been required information on gifted students, this type, this, 5% of the population. So if you see that, it is an injustice to gifted students. So in, in a politically correct way, if you work there, um, try to refer them to some of the data. I mean, there's, you know, so much data on it and research that even, you know, Jan, get a hold of us. Jan and I can send you links, websites, um, research, anything you need to back you up to try to help that move forward for a student in your school. Um, and there's ways to do that that's respectful, that it, whether you're a parent or you work in the school to, to kind of help that along. But <clears throat> that was a good point to bring up, Jen. Has anyone else um, experienced things like this with students or with your or children or grandchildren and what happened? And maybe we could give suggestions or just share. Currently, right now, we are getting a 504 for my son, 
as he does have the ADHD. Actually, Dr. Al is his doctor. Um, so it was interesting to hear all that. Um, Wonderful. But we don't really know. The school just labels his, him as ADHD, even though we've given him all, them all of the other reports. And as a teacher and a parent myself, I'm like, I don't even know what to ask for him. I just want you guys to treat him fairly. Um, you know, um, so I guess for me, like what kind of things should I look for to put into his 504, um, which you not knowing him makes it hard, but he a very, in the ADHD test through Dr. Al, he scored in the 99th percentile for almost everything above 90 and everything. And his IQ is a 139. So he is probably bored out of his mind and I'm sure he, he is, is. <laughs> yeah, and he hits every single check mark of the, you know, he's a kid who is always inquisitive. He literally needs to see one more, you know, things one time and he knows everything. And I'm just at a loss being on the other end of things now, like uh, what to do without crying every time I've gone in. There. I understand. It is emotional. It's because it's a frustration. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I would say, and anyone can pipe in too after I'm talking, but I, I would say definitely make sure that they get the gifted piece in his record and, and even on the 504 so that it shows if he's at around 140, he definitely needs above level classwork. Now, it, he might have strength areas, not knowing your child, whether it could be across the board, everything. And then at that case, he might need to be excelled, um, grade excelled or subject excelled. Or it could be math science, or it could be you know arts and language arts, language. You know, it just depends on what his strengths are. But he definitely needs to be challenged because you're going to get a whole lot of other behavioral problems um, as he gets even in high school and not doing assignments because he knows it and he's bored. Like he needs to be challenged at that level of IQ, at also in the gifted side, so the academic challenge with the accommodations. Um, but there's some really good suggestions that. Tina's got in the chat as well. <clears throat> right down. She's got reduced assignments, um, alternative assessments. What grade is your student or child? Fourth. Okay. So at that level, they're probably doing things like division long division. I don't even know. I'm out of the loop a little bit with the whole like what grade they do things now, but because um, my kids are older, but <clears throat> things like that, even things like long division, they should, he, if he can get 100%, he shouldn't have to do 25 problems of it. He should be able to do the first row. And if he gets 100%, be done. So okay. how does he get moved ahead? Even if he can do 100% that, what is his learning level? Um, at what level can he get um, higher? And I would suggest the new mats test because then it will, it it's, uh, breaks it down by subject area. And then okay. you get the guidebook that says, um, and that's through Northwestern University. And okay. it, it will actually, it's an above level test. So they'll do an eighth grade test level in, in the fourth grade, but they're not supposed to study and you have to tell them ahead of time. You're not supposed to know all the answers. So don't feel like you're failing it. Just fill in everything <laughs> you can guess. Right. Like they need to know it's just a guess and it's okay. But <clears throat> I don't know how they're working it with COVID. I don't, I don't have a clue. So you'd have to go to their website. But if you put in N-U-M-A-T-S, new mats, NUMATS will bring up Northwestern University and all the information. But okay. the nice thing of that is you get a guide, like a, a guidance book that you can take to the school, the principal, the, the counselor, and the teachers on what level he's at in all those areas and where he should be, uh, where his learning should begin. So okay. it's a tool you can Because I know his social emotional, like that's the problem. He honestly acts like a five-year-old. Like he doesn't. I get it. <laughs> Yeah, and so like that's where we're like we don't want him to be ahead, you know, go a grade ahead because right now he's still in the elementary. But if we next year he's going to be moved into the intermediate, and that's why we started the five hundred four this year. He's that's great. okay now, but I know next year he is not going to be okay. Um, that's great. So. Make sure they have the gifted in the five hundred four. Make sure even okay. that you can ask to submit into his file samples of things that he does that are above level. You know, okay. like if he's really high at reading, um, <clears throat> maybe get in his file some of the books that he's reading or things he's doing that are at home that are way above what he's in at school, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, and All Tina right. just piped in that New Mats is not testing this year, but I would still reference that because when they do test to get in on that, if it's next year, because it's fine to do that at fifth grade and you'll have a tool to help him move ahead. Um, okay. But she suggested the COGAT, which I agree with that. COGAT is a great test because it's 
it's even for nonverbal um, students as well. So, so some students, gifted students, have a super high vocabulary. Other gifted students have a really low speaking vocabulary level, but a super high comprehension level from reading really above level books, but they don't speak like that level. So it, it could be helpful too with, for the younger students. Um, and that have, school will know if I say COGAT, they'll know what I'm talking about, right? That, that's a common test. Yeah, they should. Okay. Thank you, Tina. That's great. Yes. Thank you very much, Tina. And we'd love to hear later, like what happens next year. Whatever. Yeah, I was say I knew I the new math you guys talked about in a different meeting that I put down and I never got anywhere with it because I didn't. Know I'll what just I was check really the doing. website. So you see, the nice part of that is though, and it sounds like you're not you're not missing anything this year because they're they can't take it in person. That's, sorry, sorry. The joy of working at home. I apologize, but um, so yeah, I would definitely check it out because they take that test with other little people like them. So they're not taking it with eighth graders or whatnot. So, oh, perfect. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Any Sorry other? Sorry, I had to help my kid. <laughs> I understand? Yes. Um, is, are there any other scenarios, Stacy, or it looks like we have Matt or or Tina, even if you want to type it, or Joanna, that are going on in your world that we could potentially point you some direction. Not right now, but I love the way that my grandson tries to advocate for himself. We were doing the remote learning um, last week and half of this week. And every time he would have to hold up his whiteboard with his like math assignment, he would write across the bottom, these are too easy. Please find me harder work. He's six years old. You know, <laughs> He needs harder work if he's doing that. If he's yeah. writing that on his board, but I love that he's telling the teacher this too. Usually they just tell the parent or the grandparent, you got to figure it out, but that's good. Yep. Um, so for him, you can ask for the end of school year test for his grade, whatever grade he's in. He's in first or kindergarten or what is he in? First grade. So I would ask for the end of the year test uh, right now, because now you can be looking at placements even for next year. And then if he does, so my first question I would ask to the school or teacher is, before I even ask for that, that I would say, what grade does a student need to get to pass first grade, uh, you know, on the assessments? So if they say, oh, 75%, well, then your student shouldn't have to get 95% to pass is what I'm saying. <laughs> so my first question is, what is a passing grade for that level, that grade level to go to second grade? Then I would say, since he needs a lot harder math, we don't know what level exa exactly he is at, like where that challenge will begin for him. So can he take the end of first grade assessment now? Obviously he's gonna ace that. Then I would say, can he take the end of second grade math or whatever it is, uh, assessment? Because even if you bring things to them with IQ, it, it, it's hard for teachers to translate that to what does that mean in their classroom? Like they like to know a teacher likes to know what levels the student has so they then can figure out how to help um so that's a, that's actually speaking the school's language the district's language if they can take those assessments and just see where where does he stop and he'll probably think it's super fun if he's you know he can do that while they're doing this easy math for him he can do these assessments or something because they're usually just a paper you fill it all out you know that kind of thing in the classroom if it's in the classroom he might think that's more fun than doing the assignment anyways, instead of feeling like it's a big test. <laughs> yeah, he actually has a really good teacher this year. And when he gets done with all of his work before the rest of the class, she has a special book that he can get assignments out of. So when he's in the classroom, she's able to do that. But with the remote learning, she, she didn't think to send anything home. I like that because he thinks that's fun. Yes. Um, but I would ask for higher level math because now he's doing extra work. If he was doing the right level math, and, and it's fine because it's fun to him right now. As he gets older, he's going to choose not to do extra work, <laughs> and then he could have behavior yeah. problems. So um, I like that she's giving him something because she's trying to help. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's your first piece if you have a, a teacher who wants to help your student. So I would just say, once you can find out what level math he's actually at for learning, if he can do that math while they're doing whatever math, he actually will take longer to do his math if it's the right learning level. So he should mm -hmm. track around the same time as the other students, you know, a little closer to how long it takes him. 
All right, can I interject something? Yes, please. Uh, um, we use the key math test at the elementary level, and that really helps with um, what level they're working at in math. And also, um, I use the Continental Math League problems, CML it's called. You should be able to find it online. I haven't really looked lately, but um, it's CML, Continental Math League. They have excellent um, challenging program, uh, problems and it's a great program. And that's something they could have him do while they're, and there's so many online math programs. You can even do things like, Smithsonian or National, Ge National Geographic, there's an educator site where they can put in a, to a, a like a topic and a level, a grade level. Like there's so many resources out there that they can use to get them at his level that won't take a ton of time for the teacher. And they can even use what they have. Like, so I've seen before, and S we actually tried this with um, a couple different students, was in first grade, they would go up to the second, third grade class for the 20 minute math, and then they come back to the first grade um, and they don't really miss a ton in 15, 20 minutes, <laughs> but it's bumping them ahead because usually they, they have accelerated math or something older, but this will take care of that in the lower levels like first, second grade where they don't generally have different programs, but he, he could still stay in his class and do the higher level. If he is across the board, like he can write higher than them and read higher than them, I don't know, but I would grade excel him. And I, we can get, Jan and I can give you a plethora of different acceleration research that shows they do so much better. I accelerated three of my kids. Um, it was the best thing ever. Um, it's not the first thing that a school will go to, but when you find out that he's that high a level, they actually do better, even social emotionally, if they are with their intellectual peers over their age peers. Yeah, she anyway, said he's already one. reading. He's already reading at a fourth grade level too. Yeah, see, uh, he's going to yeah. go to second grade, and they're going to do the alphabet books. You're in level A, B, C, D. I mean, he's all way ahead of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at acceleration options, but um, the school might have to get there. Like they might have to do these tests to see, and they need to have the data. Um, but I think he'd be. I'm guessing he would gravitate towards the older students if you went to a park or you went to whatever or adults who probably likes to talk at a higher level because of interest <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. that's also another benefit to great acceleration and they're so close in age anyways within a year or whatever but right. usually if you can get him great excel a year and he's actually not two years ahead in math or something it's a lot easier for them to accelerate him in the next level class a year if that makes sense instead of trying mm -hmm. to do two years ahead in a grade <clears throat> yeah thank but you I would say first steps is um have the teacher it sounds like she's willing to work with you do end of year assessments and just say i, I we need to find out what level is he at because we don't know <clears throat> and then you can take it from there but yeah thank you yeah i'm glad you spoke up that's all any other things that are coming up Wow, look at you. You're not Matt. That's just what Matt That's my husband. <laughs> I actually, I do have a question. Yes, and, please. Um, so I actually, I homeschool our uh, kiddo. He's 10 years old and he's in the fourth grade. But from the very get-go, he's been a very fast learner, amazing memory. Um, you know, my parents will give me a book to read about something and he'll get his hands on his and is just reading it you know lickety split no problem Love it. um we are thinking of going into like transitioning into the public school and my question is is there should i go ahead and do that testing myself what is the benefit of having the test him tested or not um because right now I mean, doing the homeschooling, we have the benefit of simply, okay, yes, he understands that math. We're on to fractions now, and he's, you know, breezing through that and it's not a big deal. And, um, and same with reading and comprehension and mm -hmm. vocabulary and writing. Um, and then he can really kind of, you know, he loves writing. And so he's writing books and, you know, doing that thing, doing those things um, on his free time. But I, mm -hmm. so my question is, 
what the benefits are of testing, if it's needed um, to go into the public schools, if that's helpful. Um, and I also think that there's probably an ADHD tendency, so twice exceptional um, component of it as well. Um, so I guess I, I don't really know where to go. Sure. Does he, so if he is engaged in something super interesting to him, <clears throat> reading or researching something online or a map that he's, it's a new concept, um, how, do, how is the ADHD at that point? He can stay pretty focused when he is interested very interested and in nothing like he doesn't hear me call his name or he, you know he's just so into it that if i give him instruction when he's doing something oftentimes people will think well he's just not responding to you he's not listening and it's it's just because he's so in, intensely sure. into what he's researching or or doing yep um if that answers that question yes it does that's a really common gifted trait. That's why I was asking the question. Um, I don't know your child, but it sounds like a typical highly gifted child that may not have ADHD, but I mean, there are some that do, but those who are highly gifted look like that because their brains are racing. I was thinking about a whole bunch of things at the same time, <laughs> um, but that's just normal high giftedness um <clears throat> he has had the is a he you said right yes yeah he has had the perfect education scenario for a gifted mind because you're letting him track as fast as he needs to in math in the higher level books so that's not going to be the case when he gets into public school it's going to be very grade level driven books he can read math level he's at, any of that. The social emotional will be fantastic for him because it's gonna, he needs to learn how to you know, maneuver in the world, if you will, for people who aren't like him, right? Um, but I would definitely, so to answer your question, I would definitely gather data. I would test, get that testing. I for sure would because you need to have as much data as you can entering that school system for proper placement. So if he's fourth grade, but he's at sixth grade in every level, it makes the most sense to have him do the sixth grade level stuff. And if he's, or put him in fifth grade so he can do sixth grade level stuff or whatever that case may be, it'll depend on the student. Um, when we're talking about acceleration, there is a tool, the Iowa Acceleration um, Evaluation, if you will, but it is, a, it is something schools can use that looks at that social emotional piece. Um, Jan and I are big advocates of that tool when you're looking at um, great acceleration as well, because it's a piece that looks at the social emotional, not just academic, that you can put those together. Now, if it says, no, don't accelerate this student, I have a student that said that because they're high anxiety, she accelerated beautifully. It's a tool, it's a piece of the picture. Um, but it's nice to have that information. So if you do accelerate, you kind of know what things might be the challenges, what areas, that kind of thing. Um, but I would definitely gather all the data. So I think I was telling Joanna that too. I would gather what level he's reading at. What books? Is he reading adult books? Is he reading young adult books? Is he reading? What are those titles? And, and make a document of all the reading he does for fun. It's going to be way higher level than he's doing at the school level in fifth grade. Um, I would definitely do those. So even if you do testing like COGAD or um, Weschler's, that's a good piece of data, but also to have the other piece of data that since you're homeschooling, you can get your hands on those higher level tests of where does his guessing correctly stop mm -hmm. <laughs> in math or any of those, you know, what level is he writing at? What level is he reading at? Um, usually writing lags reading in these gifted kids, but he still could be well above his typical fourth, fifth grade, whatever level he's at. So all that data, and I would walk in and say, here's my student, what's the best fit? It's, if you have a student that high, it's not necessarily gonna be the grade level chronologically. It might be, and he could even do all the specials, you know, gym and, and um, all the arts, you know, if they have a music or band and they have gym or any of those, you could still have him do that at his 
grade level if you wanted. And then he could do all the subject areas in the classes that were at his academic level. So there's a lot of variations you can do. Might be to just put them fully in that grade. It's just, it depends. But what you need to do is gather the data, the testing, his academic levels, what is he actually doing, where's learning begin, and um, present that piece to the school for the intake. Like where, what, I need to talk to you because he doesn't fit the normal mold. <laughs> so okay. I hope that helps. I mean, yeah, all that would be does. Data. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any other questions with what you guys are dealing with or in general? Yeah, so Kelly, I know you're working on curriculum um, for a program at Ferris State for, um, for college students. And I was just wondering how that was going. I forgot about that for my updates. Yeah, so um, like everything else, the education departments in all universities right now are all over the place. So what I'm doing is creating a three class pilot. Um, I'm in the midst of doing that and I'm going to offer that for anybody. So any teachers or anything, and it's going to be on gifted, <clears throat> the social emotional, the academic piece, um, <clears throat> a little history on it and the laws that we have. In Michigan and then also a teacher you know a curriculum piece to that and that's gonna be a series of three courses and it a short courses <clears throat> like a month long or whatever not like a semester but um, what it's gonna do is uh, train it's pretty much professional development on gifted is what it is and it's gonna train anyone whether it's a counselor a teacher an administrator a parent on all the things gifted, kind of a lot of stuff that we've talked about today and the doctor talked about. Um, but I, what we're gonna do is offer it to the Michigan Department of Education to put out there, because there's nothing right now in Michigan in any college anywhere that's teaching that. So we'll be housed under the Ferris umbrella, but it'll be a non-credit, it'll be like a CEU type thing, um, sketches it is now. But um, so it, that is coming along. I got um, taken off of that at work for a bit, but we will be getting back to finishing it. <laughs> uh, so that is in the process. And then we're gonna try to introduce that to the MBE. And if I can pilot it and it goes really well and there's interest, then I can take that up to Ferris as a per credit to get in the education field or counseling or whatever is needed. So all right, thank you for doing that. We, we definitely need that in Michigan. Oh my goodness, I know. <laughs> my spare time. <laughs> um, is there any other questions? I've really enjoyed having all you guys on here today and I love when you bring up just different scenarios. It takes Jan and I back to a bit like, you know, oh yes, this happened, that happened, this helped, that kind of thing. And we love to talk about that stuff. Is there anything else while we're still on? How are we getting the papers from Dr. Al? Do we have so just emailing I them out? That's a good question. So the papers are in at the top of the chat. So on the chat, if you hover over your box, like this black box of Zoom, there'll be a chat in the middle of it that you can click. And at the top of the chat are his three um, links to his three things that he showed today. So if you want to, and you can do that now, if you want to just click them, it'll open them for you and you can save them later or whatever, um, or copy the minutes. links and put them somewhere. Okay. You can go ahead and do that right now, and then uh, we're going to send out the recording to anyone who has registered because we had a lot of registrations that we had, had emails and stuff where they got taken away and they couldn't come. They want to see it, so we're going to send it out, and it'll also be showing up in the um, video as well. The links, but it's like a long Google link, so I thought it might be better if you just copied it from there right now instead of trying to write it down from a. Well, and I don't know. I came in late, so it's not at the top of my chat. So. Oh, I'll re-put it. That's a great point because okay. if you did come in late, it doesn't show for whatever reason in Zoom. It doesn't show the previous. I'm glad you said that. Um, there they are again. All right. Thank you. Now they're at the bottom too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so good point. I'm glad you said that. I forgot that it does that in Zoom if you come in after. But with that, um, I think it's a wrap. We can get out 20 minutes early. Jen, did you have anything else to add? Oh, not right now. You did a great job. And thanks for joining in and piping in for me. <laughs> I like to hear other people talk better. <laughs>
So thank you guys so much. Um, if you got the links, we're good. I can end the meeting and then we'll send out the recording. Perfect. Thank you so much Thanks for joining us. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.